Okay. So that assignment 12 is due on Wednesday. It's got two problems. Did anybody already attempt the first problem? A couple. Yeah, okay. <laughs> we'll count that as an attempt. Okay. So, um, yeah, we did an example in Friday that uh, informs how to do the first problem, and then the example we're about to do here in a moment, I think we'll show you how to do the second one. Now, on Friday is the Virginia's conference, and so our class meeting will be online that day, and that, I think, will free up a lot of people to go and participate in some of the in-person events that are being held at uh, Beach Fork. So I'll show you a schedule in just a moment, but um, even if you're not involved with the ASCE student group, I think it could be really fun just to hang out the lake for the day. So I'd encourage you to do that. I'll be out there. The final project is due on the 17th, and um, so with that, remember to address all the improvements that you've made to your reservoir, to your pipe network, to your demand estimation, kind of the, uh, the enhanced overview that would allow someone who's not familiar with the project background to understand what you've done. Okay, um, now here's that schedule related to the Virginia's conference, and you can see that it begins on Thursday afternoon. There's some seminars and games and presentations and stuff. Uh, some of it's over in Smith Hall across the street. Some of it's here in the engineering building. But then on Friday, the majority of the fun in the morning and the afternoon is over at Beach Fork Lake. And then in the evening, they're having a, a banquet. And then Saturday morning, they're having the Steel Bridge competition over at the, the football stadium. And so, I mean, that's another thing that could be kind of an interesting spectator opportunity is go and watch people's bridge wobble as they try and load them up. Um, I think there's a few people in here in ASE. What should people come to? I mean, I think Concrete Grizzly is going to be kind of cool because I'm running that. OK. <laughs> yeah. You're going to make it cool. <laughs> Do you need any volunteer catchers, people you know to catch what? the Frisbees? I, I could use some of these big, strong guys. Hey, yeah. I could definitely use Chad. Yeah. <laughs> Just <laughs> one, though. But, uh, uh, I think Concrete Canoe is going to be the best for them. Yeah. Well, I can't wait. I just hope it looks like the weather's going to be nice. So fingers crossed. OK. So I'd encourage you to be involved, but uh, regardless, the lecture that day is recorded. So um, I'll give you the flexibility to do whatever. Are you doing the Hardy Frost presentations? Um, I might go to them. I'm not doing any presentations, though. I'm presenting for that one. Are you? Great. OK, this is where we're at with gradually varying flow, GVF. We've got a, a gradual transition in water depth where we may know the depth at one location. So here a downstream depth is known and we'll say for a certain length we want to know how deep is the water let's say 200 meters upstream. So this is the type of problem we're trying to solve where we know the depth in one location and we have non-uniform flow and the depth upstream is what depth? Okay, so this is the example that we're going to jump to to begin with, and then we'll circle back to the theory. We've got a, uh, an obstacle in the flow that is causing pooling immediately upstream of the obstacle. And the obstacle is in a canal where we know the, the channel slope. So 0 0.0015 is the channel slope. The channel width is seven meters and it's a rectangular channel so that's going to simplify a lot of our geometry here but the channel is not wide. Do you remember the technical definition for a wide channel? 20, 20, 20. If it's 20 times wider than it is deep then that makes things even easier to calculate. Well we're not quite there but at least it being a rectangular channel makes some things relatively simple like the normal depth and the critical depth the geometry there is simple. We know the flow rate it's carrying, 15 cubic meters per second. So upstream of a broad crested weir, so that's here at this location, just before this obstacle, the water depth is 3.8. And we want to characterize the length of the backwater curve. So the backwater curve is just 
all of the water is changing in depth until it finally reaches the normal depth. So we want to find out how far upstream do you have to go to where it's just normal depth and there's no longer any variation. So along the way, we're going to calculate some of these intermediate things because they help us to calculate the length of the backwater curve. And um, so let's start with the critical depth. The critical depth for a rectangular channel, we can calculate most easily by knowing the flow per unit width, lowercase q. So it's q divided by v. So for this one, that is 15 cubic meters per second flowing through a 7 meter wide channel. Right? So what does that make our flow per unit width? 15 divided by 7, 2.14 meters squared per second. And so the critical depth, y sub c, is the flow per unit width squared divided by g to the one third power because it's rectangular. Remember, if it wasn't, we'd have to calculate the critical depth using the full crowd number equation. But it is rectangular. So 2.14 and change meters squared per second and we square that divided by 9.81 meters per second squared to the one-third power. Okay, our critical depth is 0 0.7764 meters. And we also need to know the normal depth. Okay, so the normal depth, here's the Manning's equation, Q equals A to the five-thirds slope to the one-half divided by n times p to the two-thirds. And um, for a rectangular channel like we've got, where the water is flowing at a depth of y sub n, the normal depth, and it has a width, lowercase b, is 7 meters, then our, uh, our area so the flow is 15 cubic meters per second. The area is 7 times y sub n. And that'll be to the 5 thirds power. Our slope for this channel, the problem defines it as 0 0.0015. And that's to the 1 half power. The n value for this channel concrete with an n value of 0 0.012. I'm sorry, 20. And then the wetted perimeter. What's the wetted perimeter for a rectangular channel? <coughs> for this one? B plus 2y. B plus 2y. Good. Because it's 7 meters on the bottom plus 2 times the sides. And that's to the 2 thirds power. Okay. So we put this into our solver, and just to save time here, the normal depth is 1.195 meters. So do we have, for this slope, is this slope steep or mild? We can know that by comparing the normal depth to the critical depth. The slope, is it steep or mild? And steep, remember, would mean a slope that is going to uh, carry supercritical flow. Mild is that under normal conditions the flow is subcritical. We have mild, right, because uh, let me write this on the board for y sub n is greater than y sub c slope is mild. So under steady uniform flow conditions will be subcritical. Okay, so here the third point that it's asking, what is the water surface profile type? What that means is we have to look at the water where we know this depth, just up, upstream of the obstacle, where it is given that the flow depth is 3.8 meters. So the given depth is deeper than both the normal depth and the critical depth. So that's going to put us into a certain zone, zone one, which we're going to come back to this slide in just a minute. But for now, I'll just tell you that we are in zone one 
because for this problem, the shallowest depth is the critical depth. And then we know here is the normal depth for this next line. And our given flow depth is above both of those. So y is greater than y sub n, which is greater than y sub c. That means we have an m1 profile, mild slope. And the actual flow depth is above both the critical and the normal depth. So we'll come back and talk about this a little bit more. But we're in zone 1, and so this is an M1 profile, the water surface profile, M1. OK, now how many segments should be used? The rule of thumb for this direct step method is that you should, because what we're going to do is we're going to divide this up into segments. Because we can't just go all the way from here, where we have the known depth, to the upstream location where it's the normal depth in a single jump. And the reason why is that the formula that we're going to be using to find the slope of the water surface, it's only valid at a point. So if we're trying to find out like what is the depth upstream, we can use this equation to say what is the slope at the point where we know the depth of the water. So we can find the slope of the water surface here. Well, what happens if you extend that slope upstream? It's just going to run into the bottom of the channel. So the slope at this location isn't the same as the slope here, and the slope there, and the slope there. The slope is changing as it approaches the upstream normal depth. So we can apply this equation over just a small segment. We don't want to jump too far upstream. But what we're going to try and do is we're going to break it up into pieces where, like this is obviously a curve, right? But over this distance, we can approximate that by a line. We can get away with that. And if we break it up into another small segment, it's OK to approximate that curve as a line. So we're going to do the same thing. We're going to break this up into pieces and approximate the curve as a series of line segments. So the rule of thumb is that you don't want to have more than half a meter of elevation change when you're breaking it up into segments. So in this case, we're going to use the upstream location where the depth is 3.8 meters is going to be our y sub 7 because the overall elevation difference between the two points is we're going to go from when it's 3.8 meters to 1.195. So this is our finishing water depth when we're all the way upstream. And our starting water depth, y, is 3.8 meters. So it's 3.8 meters is y7. y1 is 1.195. And so if we apply that rule of thumb of no more than half a meter of elevation change per segment, uh, we've got 3.8 meters minus 1.195. So that's an elevation change of what? Um, You've got a calculator. You can double check along with me. That should be 2.605 meters. That's how much the water elevation is changing. And uh, we don't want it to be any more than increments of 0 0.5 meters per segment. So. We have to have at least 5.2 segments, and so we'll round up to six. So six segments. And so there's going to be one, two, three, four, five, six. So seven points, which define six segments. And the reason why we chose six is because that's the, uh, the smallest number we can the smallest number of segments that obeys this rule of thumb of no more than 
half a meter of elevation difference. We could use more segments than that, and um, it wouldn't increase the complexity of our calculations too much since we're going to do it with a spreadsheet. But for this one, let's just all stay on the same page and use um, six segments. Okay, now this is where we use the template file. So if you've got Excel and that template file that I put onto Blackboard, should look like this. Okay, so our channel width for this is 7 meters, so just type that in for the B. Our known flow rate is 15 cubic meters per second. S naught, the slope of the channel, is 0 0.0015 meters of vertical per horizontal. And then our N value, the, the channel roughness for this concrete, is 0 0.02. Now you can see what I've got here is our starting elevation. This is the Y7. And then our finishing elevation, 1.195. That's the normal depth. And I just kind of, um, I found these intermediate depths manually by saying if we've got 2.605 meters and we're doing it in uh, six segments, so divided by six, then uh, each one is going to have an elevation change of 0 0.434 meters of elevation change per segment. So I just started with the 3.8, and then I said, I want to have even elevation increments between them until I get to 1.195. But if I did here like 3.6, zero instead of 3.66, that's okay. Um, it doesn't have to be like perfect, perfectly placed between them. I'll, I think you'll, you'll understand a little bit more why we've got some flexibility in what we use as these intermediate elevations. The ones that have to be exact is the known upstream water depth and the known um, normal depth that we're trying to find once we have gone all the way upstream to uniform conditions again. Okay, so where the water depth is 3.8 meters, let's find out what's the area when that is the depth. So the area there will be the channel width. I'm going to anchor the reference there so I can just drag down my calculations. So the width times the depth. So if the water depth is 3.8, then the cross-sectional area should be 26.6. <laughs> and since I've anchored that reference up to the width with the dollar signs, then we can just drag this down through all of them. And then I'm going to delete any of these ones that say zero. That space is there for a reason, but we're not going to use it yet. All right. So we, we know the area that's associated with each water depth. Um, velocity, okay, V equals Q divided by A. So we know the flow rate. We'll reference this and anchor it with the F4 button and then divide it by the area. So now what this is saying is when the water depth is 3.8, then the velocity of the water at that particular location is 5.64. We can drag it down through all of the rows. And then at each location where we're figuring some particular water depth, you know, there is a location along that curve where the water is this deep. And at that location where it's that deep, then this will be the velocity of the water. And so as we go upstream, the depth is decreasing and the velocity is increasing accordingly as we'd expect. There's a reduced flow area, increased velocity, because the flow rate, the Q, is the same everywhere. This can be steady, but non-uniform. So the flow rate is the same at all of the locations. OK, now, E, what we mean there is the specific energy. So that's going to be 
the depth plus the velocity head. And we know V, so it is the depth Y plus the velocity head. V squared divided by 2G. So V squared divided by 2 times G, 9.81. Okay, so where the water is deep, most of the energy is from the depth and there's very little velocity, so only a tiny fraction of the overall energy is coming from the velocity head. We can drag that down and uh, delete any of these blank ones. <clears throat> okay, are there questions, things that I went through too quickly that you need to see again? Okay, we're finally going to use that, that row that's between the depths because what we want to know is the energy difference within a certain segment because this is the upstream end of one segment. I'm sorry, this would be the downstream end of one segment. This is the upstream end of this segment. So the, uh, the delta E that we want here is the smaller one minus the bigger one. So it's how much energy is changing as we go upstream. And I think you can copy and paste that formula in all these in-between locations. And it'll tell you, as you go upstream, how much less energy there is at the next segment terminus. Okay, now uh, hydraulic radius is just another geometric parameter. Hydraulic radius is the area divided by the wetted perimeter. Okay, so um, maybe I should have added another cell which is wetted perimeter, another column. We'll do this though, and we'll embed it. So it's the area divided by the wetted perimeter. So the wetted perimeter is the width of the channel B plus 2 times the depth at that location. Okay, so hydraulic radius, area divided by wetted perimeter. Okay, and uh, again as long as we've anchored the reference up here to the width of the channel, B, with the dollar signs, then we can drag that down and then we'll delete any of these uh, intermediate ones. So we just want to know the geometric parameters at the upstream and downstream end of each segment. Okay, S sub F is the slope of the energy grade line. Here's the formula for S sub F. Now, this is for SI units. The formula is different. If you've got traditional units, then there's a coefficient in Manning's equation that's 1.49. That coefficient doesn't exist for SI units. And so that's what we've got. This is the formula we'll use. So rearranging Manning's equation for the slope of the energy grade line. So uh, we're going to say it is the N value and anchor that reference with the dollar signs times the flow rate, anchor that reference with the dollar signs, divided by, I put in the parentheses here because I need to have the area times the hydraulic radius. Now I can't click on the cell location for the hydraulic radius because my formula is spreading out over the top of it. So I actually have to just type that in, F17 to the power of two-thirds, so 0.66667. Okay, then close parentheses. Now my denominator is finished. Close parentheses again and square it. So this is going to tell us just at a single location what is the slope of the energy grade line. 
And that'll be changing at all of these different locations where we've got different depths and different cross-sectional areas. There's going to be a different energy grade line slope at each of them. So let me drag that down as well through the rest of it. And uh, all these divided by zeros, that's unsettling. So we'll just delete that. Okay, now this is the average of the slope of the energy grade line in between two segments. And so that's, again, why we're going to use this in between, because we want the average of this and that divided by 2. The average, so like, what's the slope of the energy grade line in the middle of those two segments is what we calculate at this midpoint location. And I think I can drag that down. Yeah, I can. So we just find the average of the, uh, the one up top and the one below it for each of them. OK, the next is saying we want the channel slope minus the slope of the, the average slope of the energy grade line. OK, so the channel slope is a fixed value. And so we want to have this fixed value minus the average slope of the energy grade line. OK. And again, delete all of the out of sequence ones, because this is going to be a slope that's applicable to the segment that is between the upstream and the downstream depth. OK, now the final part of the puzzle here is using this formula to calculate the segment length. So this is going to say, how far is it upstream from this location where the depth is 3.8? How far upstream do you have to go to find the location where the depth is 3.366? So we go back to the picture. This last thing that we're going to calculate, the DL, is just saying, all right, so there's a certain depth here, and we're going to go upstream until the depth is 3.3. How far is it? What's the delta L? What's the length that you have to go to find that next depth? So this is the DL, and uh, we calculate it with delta E, which is this one divided by the channel slope minus the average slope of the energy grade line. So we've just calculated that denominator here. So we have to go 299.97. Now the reason why it's minus is you go upstream to find that location where the depth is less. And um, we repeat that same equation for all of these different segments. And it tells us how far we're going upstream to each of them. And then the total overall length of the water surface profile is the sum of all of these individual segment lengths. So we have to go 24. 29.8 meters upstream before we find the normal depth. So that's the procedure. Now, unless there's questions about the spreadsheet, we're going to circle back and talk about the theory. Any questions about this example? I think saving this and having it as a reference for your homework would probably be a pretty useful resource. So. Save that. So remember that on um, Friday last week, we looked at this slide. And we've got an energy balance we're doing between an upstream and a downstream location. And if you have non-uniform flow, some of the energy is going into velocity head. Some of the energy is going into a change in water depth. 
And this equation says how much the water depth is changing between some segment distance DL. And this formula says what the water surface slope is compared to the channel slope and then the change of the water surface. Now, in gradually varied flow, the, uh, the slope, you actually would use the negative sign for the, uh, for the channel slope. And so you would put a minus sign in there. It's, although we always know that in Manning's equation, for example, the slope is a downhill slope, and we don't put the minus sign into uh, Manning's equation. Here in this formula, we do, because dy dl could be positive or it could be negative. So we have to be more explicit about uh, slopes in gradually varying flow than we otherwise have been so far. So this equation tells us the slope of the water surface at a point. And the slope of the energy grade line, S sub F, we can calculate with Manning's equation. So here I've substituted in Manning's equation to find the slope of the energy grade line, both in SI and traditional units. And this substitution is true for any shape, regardless of whether it's trapezoidal, rectangular, or anything else. But if you have a wide channel, then it's a little bit easier for us to calculate dy dl. All we have to know is the actual depth at a location, y, the critical depth, and the normal depth, and then the, uh, the, slope of the, um, the slope of the channel at that location. So they call this the process equation. And that tells you the slope of the water surface at a point and then different methods, like what we've gone over today, the direct step method, breaks a curve into segments and we linearize those individual segments by assuming that at the midpoint, you know, here in this, in this uh, equation where we found the average energy grade line slope between two points, we said, let's find the slope of the water surface um, in the middle of two segments and assume that it's linear from there. So that's this idea of the average slope of the energy grade line. And uh, sometimes the water level is increasing as you go downstream. Sometimes the water level is decreasing as you go downstream. And the slope of this will tell you whether the water is rising or falling. So we're going to skip over this example because the lessons that are embedded in it are also in the example that we've just worked. But let's talk more about water surface profiles and that classification of zone one, zone two, and zone three. Um, the, the three depths that we have to know to classify the water surface profile is the actual physical water depth, Y, what the water depth would be if conditions were normal, so that's Y sub n, which you calculate with Manning's equation, and then what is the water depth that's associated with critical flow conditions? So Y sub C. So if you know those three depths, then you can classify whether the water surface profile is mild, slope, um, steep slope, critical slope, and so on, and then which of the three zones it's in. So you need to know those three depths. And then knowing whether you have a zone one or a zone three or zone to knowing the different classification can be useful because it can help you to understand what's causing the gradual varying flow and also whether the water is increasing or decreasing as you move downstream. So the first classification is based on the bed slope. And so we've already talked about mild and steep. And here in this diagram, what you can see is that when conditions are mild, the water depth the normal depth is greater than the critical depth. Steep, then the normal depth is less than critical depth. If you've got a critical slope, then that means that under normal conditions, the water is flowing at the critical depth. There's also these two kind of unlikely or obscure slopes. And one is horizontal, meaning that you just have a flat river segment. And sometimes for brief periods, a river is completely flat. Um, or an adverse slope. And occasionally there are brief segments where 
the water can be flowing uphill. And so H would be associated with the horizontal slope, A with an adverse slope, and there's classifications that can go along with that as well. So you first classify your water surface profile by the bed slope. Now you go into the zones. And so the zones are defined by whether at the top you have the critical depth or the normal depth as the first one. So like if you've got a steep slope, then the one that's on top is the critical depth and below it is the normal depth. If you've got a mild slope, then it's the normal depth that's above and the critical depth that's beneath. And then the actual flow depth at the location is going to be anywhere above both of the lines, in the middle of the two, or beneath both of the other lines. So I could tell you, for example, just erase this. If I told you y sub n is 4.3 meters, y sub c is 1.2 meters, and y is 2.2 meters, then first you look at the relationship between the critical and the normal depth. So since normal is more than critical, that tells us <coughs> it's mild. Now we look at where does the actual flow depth fall between them. And so this and above would be zone one. Critical and below would be zone three. But since this is between them, that puts us in zone two. So if these were the flow conditions, then this would be an M2 profile. OK, just to do another one of these, if we had that the critical depth is 3.2 meters, the normal depth is 1.7 meters, and the flow depth is 0 0.9 meters, okay, we can see that this is a critical slope because the normal depth is less than the critical depth. So uh, this is supercritical conditions. So that would make it steep. So it's a steep slope. And then this and above is zone 1. Between the two is zone 2. And beneath the normal depth is zone 3. So this would be S3 conditions if these were the three depths. So. Um, <clears throat> Those are the three zones and kind of a little bit of practice on how you classify the water surface profile. And if you've got a water surface that's getting deeper in the direction of flow, then you'll have dy dl is positive. And if it's decreasing in the direction of flow, then dy dl will be negative. If uniform flow exists, then it would be zero because the channel slope is equal to the water surface slope. And then negative infinity is just that the water is going over an, an overfall. So an M1 profile will always be increasing in depth in the direction of flow. So it's because of some obstacle as you move downstream, it's positive. An M2 profile, the water surface is going to be negative. And an M3 profile is always going to be a positive water surface in the direction of flow. Um, here's a steep profile. So S1, you can see that the water surface is kind of tapering off, that the slope is getting less dramatic as you move downstream. Um, you can see if, it's, if the water depth is getting shallower or if it's getting deeper in the direction of flow for each of these cases. You don't really need to worry so much about critical slopes or horizontal slopes or adverse slopes. The main ones that are relevant here are mild and steep. Um, but occasionally, in, in rare instances, you will see some of the other classifications. And there's also some diagrams that helps you to understand what could possibly be causing these different types of profiles. Like if you had water approaching a spillway, that would most likely be causing an M1 profile. Or if water is approaching an overfall like this, that would probably be an M2 profile where the channel is mild, but it passes through zone two as the water depth is decreasing and approaching the overflow. An M3 is the profile that you'd see 
if you have a mild slope but supercritical conditions briefly as it's approaching a hydraulic jump. So the slope is mild, but that doesn't necessarily mean that the flow conditions are subcritical. You know, if your actual flow depth is less than the critical and less than the normal depth, this would be supercritical conditions here on a mild slope. So the water depth is increasing and then it goes through the hydraulic jump. And then some of the causes of S1, S2, and S3 profiles are illustrated here as well. Whether it's approaching some obstacle or having gone through a hydraulic jump. All right, so this is just covering the same ground with different illustrations showing that you know, the water depth is either increasing or decreasing in the direction of flow depending on which zone you're in. So for the mild slope, the normal depth is above the critical. For the steep slope, the critical depth is above the normal depth. Okay, um, with the time that we've got remaining, let's uh, practice classifying the water surface profile uh, for these conditions. We've got water that's flowing through a rectangular channel. The flow rate is 31 cubic meters per second. The known measured water depth at this location is 3.2. What you need to know is the normal depth and the critical depth and compare those two to the actual flow depth to find out what is the, uh, the profile criteria. Meaning, is this an M123 or an S123? So let me pause for a second and allow you to calculate the normal depth and the critical depth for this example. Okay, we're, at, we're nearly out of time here, so um, in this case, when we solve for the normal depth, we should get it's 2.717 meters, which compared to the critical depth of 1.107 means that we have a mild slope because the normal depth is greater than the critical depth, then it's a mild slope. And our actual measured flow depth is 3.2 meters, and that's larger than both of them. So that puts it into zone one with a mild slope, so it's an M1 profile. Now the last part of this example that it was asking us to do is find the water surface slope. So the water surface slope here, if we compare Manning's equation, so if we want to find uh, dy dx, so that's how the water depth is changing at the particular location where the, uh, the depth is 3.2 meters, we could find the slope of the energy grade line and put that into the process equation along with the Froude number squared and we could find the slope of dy dx. So it's positive which means that the water is getting deeper in the direction of flow and that's consistent with what we know about M1 profiles. Okay, it's 1.50, we're out of time for today. Remember that the homework that's due on Wednesday has two problems. If you've got any questions on it, let me know. We'll have uh, class on Wednesday in person and then Fridays will be online.